the Spirit of Jazz podcast, where music dances with mystery, with your hosts, Bill Carter and Jeff Kellum. Welcome back. It's the Spirit of Jazz. This is Bill Carter. And I'm Jeff Kellum. I was just going to say that voice that introduces the program, you know, each week, uh-huh. you get to know that guy better. Well, I think we've got an opportunity today. In fact, he just happens to be on this recording with us. Hello, listening public. Say hi to Mr. Chris Norton, the voice of WVIA-FM in Pittston Township, Pennsylvania, where programming is made possible by listeners like you. <laughs> Now, Jeff, why are we getting better acquainted with him today? Well, it occurred to me that for many people, although they may have a little bit of uh, jazz in their record libraries or their CD libraries, maybe they're streaming some. For many of us, the first jazz we heard and it broadened our interest in different genres was radio. There aren't too many all jazz stations, but there are a few in a few metropolitan areas. Public radio has always been the place where I would tune in to jazz programs. And I had the privilege of playing jazz on a public radio station in Richmond, Virginia for about 12 years. And then when I tired of those Saturday nights, week after week after week, I retired. And then later the next week, someone at an adult contemporary station said, Jeff, we want to do a jazz brunch. We want you to host it. And I said, that'll look like I'm selling out. So no, I I can't do that. Well, Sunday morning, I'm a Presbyterian minister. I can't do that. And then they said, we'll pay you. And I said, oh. Well, there is such a thing as tape, so we taped it on weeknights. So that was another five or six years. So there's an audience out there that wants to hear jazz on the radio. And although there's less and less of it, it appears, I think many of us who are now streaming jazz, who are buying jazz, we kind of grew up hearing the voices on the radio playing the music they really loved. So I thought we ought to dedicate a show to that. The original golden age of radio, uh, the late 20s and into the 30s and even into the early 40s, a lot of the music that was played on the radio wasn't necessarily considered classic jazz. It was music of the day, big bands in particular. And uh, now we think of that as being oldies in the jazz world. (laughs) But in fact, radio and jazz kind of grew up together in America, I think you would say. And it is sad that there's there's something like 15,000 radio stations across the United States. And the latest I saw, something like 80, said they play some jazz. Oh, my gosh. Now, that doesn't mean they're all jazz stations. But even that, 80 stations, that's fewer than two per state. Yeah. And some states probably have zero. And many of them are not pure jazz 24-7. Some of them are like jazz by night, classical by day. Almost all of them are in the non-commercial band, the the public radio kind of end of the dial. And most of them are public radio stations. They're supported by donations. As a commercial format, it doesn't really exist. You can't raise enough advertiser support around jazz to make that a going venture. So a lot of public radio stations still maintain a mission to support jazz as much as they can, although many of them are not full time. There are a few. There are a few. There's a really outstanding and nation leading jazz station that serves the New York market from Newark, New Jersey. WBGO is a, is a legend. And there's some of the West Coast and New Orleans has one that's run by a jazz and historical foundation to keep that alive. But for most of the country, there's not a whole lot of jazz on the radio. If you're lucky that your public radio station has some jazz, they probably also carry some NPR news and talk programming, and they may carry some classical music program. They may carry some AAA contemporary music. They may mix jazz with blues and think it's all pretty much the same thing. There aren't a lot, a whole lot of jazz pure radio stations around the country. And those few that do exist are often being streamed outside their listening area. They're not limited anymore by their towers and their transmitters so that I can listen to a full-time jazz station out of San Diego. So they do have a a reach, but as you say, Chris, the audience has dwindled and uh, so is the number of stations. And a lot of people have found that listening to music online is not quite the same as listening to it over the air. Processing is different. It can be a thinner kind of sound, depending on what kind of speakers you have attached and things like that. 
many stations now have additional digital channels over the air. Mm -hmm. They're broadcasting digitally in what is called HD radio, high definition radio. Uh, my own station, for example, has its main signal, which is NPR news in the morning and afternoon, classical music for a while in the middle of the day, a little jazz at night, a little AAA at night, and then more news on the overnight. But we have two additional channels that broadcast digitally in HD radio. One of them we call WVIA Arts, and that's really all classical 24-7. Yeah. The second digital channel is now called the Chiaroscuro channel, and it is all jazz all the time. It's not the whole breadth of the jazz universe. It is all from the Chiaroscuro record label, because as far as I know, we may be the only public radio station in America that owns a jazz label. It was gifted to us years ago, and so we are the curators of that unique blend of classic jazz, straight ahead mainstream jazz, many featuring some of the jazz lions, the great artists who played in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. And then when the mainstream record labels in America had had it with jazz and they realized they couldn't sell that many records of it, a lot of these players did not have a way to get their music recorded. They were still playing live gigs, but uh, it was difficult to get anything preserved on vinyl at the time. Right. A guy named Hank O'Neill created a, a small boutique record label called Chiaroscuro Records, recorded a lot of these lions, many of whom he knew, he knew personally. And it was a real labor of love for him because he was a big jazz fan himself. And that was the starting of Chiaroscuro Records. And tell us about that word, because it's not in some uh, dictionaries. Yeah. Well, first thing you need to know is how to pronounce it. And then you guys are good with that. But it's really a, an amalgamation of two Italian words. Chiaro for light and oscuro for dark. And when they're held together in the same word, you have light with dark. It's really a term in the art world that describes a certain painting technique that emphasizes the contrast of light and dark without a whole lot of color necessarily. Originally, it's kind of shadow and illumination, uh, and it creates some very dramatic effects in a certain period of classic artwork. But an old jazz lion of the 1930s, Eddie Condon, used to host what were called what he called chiaroscuro concerts. Hmm. And that inspired Hank O'Neill when he decided to found this label to adopt that term because he thought it described very well several things. First of all, the skin tones of great jazz musicians, some light, some dark. And when they play together, it can be magic. Secondly, he was quite a, and still is, quite a photographer in addition to a jazz fan and all the other interesting things he's done in his life. And he worked a lot in black and white photography. And when he was just getting started and didn't have a whole lot of resources to put behind the label, the album covers were black and white. And that worked into the chiaroscuro theme too. The whole term chiaroscuro has come to mean something special about the music and about the appearance and about the whole style of what Chiaroscuro Jazz is all about. Yeah. Chris, how can our listeners tune into this uh, internet station? Well, if you happen to be in northeastern Pennsylvania, it's over the air. It's on, it's on the radio if you have a, a newer digital radio that can pick up HD radio signals. Uh, it's, it's adjacent to our main channel in the FM band. But since far more people don't live in northeast Pennsylvania than do, uh, it's available online as a web stream at any time. The website is chiaroscurojazz.org. And there's a lot there's a lot to that website. Uh, one of them is you can hear this 24-7 music stream just by clicking on it. And you can listen as long as you want from anywhere in the world. We've, we've heard from people listening in Japan uh, and other places who, who say, yeah, this is a different different style of jazz. It's, uh, it doesn't get as heavy into some forms of jazz as, as are currently popular. Smooth jazz, for example, it's not about that. This is straightforward, uh, straight ahead, mainstream jazz, largely featuring some of the lions of the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So it's available online at chiaroscurojazz.org at any time. Also, there is the history of the label, how it got started, as well as the complete catalog of CDs that they have available. So you can see all the artists uh, that have been featured on Chiaroscuro over the years. I believe the first release was by a, a pianist named Earl Hines, Father mm -hmm. Hines. 
it was astonishing for Karis Girl Records because the, the year that came out, 1971, it was nominated for a Grammy Award. It didn't win that year. Some guy by the name of Bill Evans had, a, had an album out the same time and he won. Uh, and a couple of years later, Bill Evans recorded for Karis Girl. So we, we got him too. But from those days, in throughout the 70s, there were more than 100 LPs that were recorded and released by um, Hank O'Neill for Chiaroscuro Records. It kind of tapered off in the 80s. At one time, it got to be too much, and, and Hank had a lot of other interests that he was pursuing at the same time. It kind of got revitalized in the late 80s. When a businessman and jazz lover who personally had all of the all of the CD, all of the albums in the Karaskira collection, in his own collection, bought in and essentially revitalized the label, brought some new projects like recording music on jazz cruises aboard ships at sea, like a, a holiday program that he kind of hosted and produced that was run on a number of NPR stations around the country called Christmas Music Jazz Feeling. And it featured commentary and introductions of holiday tunes by some of these great, uh, great performers. Virtually many of the artists who had recorded for Karaskiro agreed to host that show one year and play some favorite holiday songs. Those programs are still active on the Karaskiro channel. Uh, they're played in the holidays. George Graham, the A&R director for Karasco Records and the host of jazz on WVIA will be, bring, will be bringing them out certainly for the holiday season again this year. Welcome to the 23rd edition of Christmas Music, The Jazz Feeling. I'm Hank O'Neill with my very special guest, Dave and Iola Brubeck. For One of my favorite memories was the day that I met Hank O'Neill. Uh, thanks to you, you called up and said, do you remember how to get to Dave Brubeck's house? And I said, but I have to show you. <laughs> so we went over and recorded Dave and Iola, and they were reflecting on Christmas memories. And here comes Hank with all of his equipment in the living room. And uh, Iola made us lunch, as I recall. Wow. And you bought her flowers. There we are recording Dave Brubeck's memories about, about his career and some holiday tunes that he particularly liked. I, if, I don't, if I recall correctly, he played one right then and there he that did. we included in the program as a live recording. It was it's pretty astonishing. And that program happened every year in the, in the weeks leading up to Christmas time yeah. for quite a few years. And there's quite a collection of these guys telling their stories. Hmm. Tell us a little bit more about your station. Where is it located? How, how far does it reach? WVIA is an NPR station that also has a little bit of classical music and a little bit of jazz and a little bit of contemporary music. And basically, we're trying to serve four different constituencies, the news fans of our area, classical music lovers, jazz lovers, and a musical format called AAA. It's essentially contemporary music, but not the hit stuff. It's all the interesting, good stuff that for some reason or other doesn't make the top 10 anywhere. But George Graham is amazing in his ability to sift through the hundreds of releases all the time to find some really interesting music. But we try to keep those four different constituencies happy with one 24-hour radio signal. We're at 89.9 FM in northeastern Pennsylvania, reaching into central Pennsylvania, a little bit eastern uh, edge of the state and probably just barely across the line into the Binghamton area. We're also online at WVI.org, so you can listen to us in Japan, too, if you want to. Uh, we have several translators in communities around the scranton Wilkesbury area, which is the central part of our market, as it were, the radio market east into the Poconos, west into Williamsport and Lewisburg, and that kind of works. That kind of extends the signal a little farther, but it still is a regional eastern Pennsylvania signal. Well, and you have a commitment to the jazz musicians in your region as well. As I know firsthand, you've recorded uh, jazz festivals, recorded um, and been on, on site when there's significant events. Any of those come to mind? Well, here we got to talk about a real legend and icon of WVIA, George Graham who was the first WVIA radio employee 51 years ago. The station's just celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. But George is celebrating his 51st anniversary because he arrived a year before the radio station even existed. He was employed by the television station essentially to wire a radio studio in the same building and get the engineering ready. And uh, after six or eight months of this, it finally was ready and went on the air in the spring of 1973. At that point, George Graham said, 
you know, my work is not done here. I would, I think I'd like to be on the air. I could host jazz and contemporary music. And we didn't want to be a top 40 station. We knew that. I say we, I wasn't, I was not around at the time. I was barely out of high school, but the station said, go for it, George. We'd love to have you. So he's hosted a jazz and a AAA format ever since the 1970s, and he's still going strong. But the reason he's so remarkable is that he is a fully qualified broadcast engineer, a fully qualified audio engineer who has recorded and presented many artists over the year. He has a whole series called Homegrown Music in which uh, musicians like piano playing Pastor Bill Carter would come in with some ragtag bunch of musicians he picked up and called Presby Bop and, and record music there. Other musicians from our region, of which there are quite a few who are world class. We're only an hour away from the Delaware Water Gap community, which is an immense center of jazz talent. These folks all play in New York on a regular basis and live in eastern Pennsylvania. And they throw a fabulous nonprofit jazz festival every year in September. And it, it's enormous. They've been doing that for decades, too. George Graham, for many of those decades, has recorded two, three days and nights of music at that festival and then presented it on WVIA, our FM station, in the same year. And he's been doing that for a long time. That's the big jazz festival. There are others. There's a Scranton Jazz Festival and there are other contemporary music events. And he does live studio concerts, too. He brings mm-hmm. bands and individual performers into the studio to record them, put them on the air. Some Sometimes they're live, sometimes they're recorded. Sometimes it's a television show. It's always a radio show, too. And he's been doing that for 51 years. Yeah. And not missing a beat. And in his spare time, he's the A&R director for Kiara Skira Records. Right, right, right. And this is the this is the value of the radio station, the local radio station. I mean, I listen to, to Real Jazz on Sirius XM, and I appreciate that being in my car. But Real Jazz uh, is not going to tell you about the local jazz festival happening in your community. They're not going to tell you about uh, the local jazz artist who's playing at a local church or, or someplace. Um, they're, they're playing on the big time, you know, national and international jazz. But uh, the local stations have an opportunity to just connect with the audience, with the listener in a very personal way, and build a sense of community, which I think is really important. Well, and that sense of community um, is really about friendship. And George has befriended scores of jazz musicians. Uh, in an upcoming episode, we'll be talking with Bill Mays, the great pianist, and who speaks most highly of George and is constantly kind of connecting with him about a little project here or there. Sherry Miracle, who was on an episode a few back, knows him well. You know, he knows the whole bunch. Marco Marcinko of the Scranton Jazz Festival. Uh, and as uh, George and I joke about the ubiquitous Tony Marino, the great bass player who is everywhere. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your insights this day. Is there anything you'd like to say to the jazz world on behalf of the radio? Well, there's one other project I ought to let you know on. A relatively recent addition to the Chiara Skiro collection are podcasts. You're doing a podcast here. That's great. George Graham has had the opportunity to sit down with a number of musicians and talk about their influences in music and trace many of them to chiaroscuro artists. Guys like Tom Scott, the legendary West Coast session uh, sax player, the LA Express man. I mean, he played with the Blues Brothers in the 1980s, and he has all kinds of connections to the Clark Terrys of the world and, and, and other great jazz musicians who came before him. And this podcast series has included uh, some artists who recorded their own commentary on their own careers. People like Dizzy Gillespie and Cab Calloway and Lionel Hampton and just incredible musicians. There's a whole series of podcasts, uh, one artist per each, and they're available also at chiaroscurojazz.org. You can listen anytime you like. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really special for me because I I have such a love for jazz radio and uh, appreciate hearing more about WVIA's offerings and Chiaroscuro Records. In fact, when I was doing a pilot for a a program I wanted to develop, uh, I played one of those uh, Chiaroscuro albums. I was just looking for it behind me here to see which artist it was. And you mentioned, Chris, the black and white label. And of course, there's that black and white label on the record, which was kind of unusual. You know, most people want it to pop and to, and to grab your attention, but uh, wonderful outreach uh, and, and keeping this jazz alive and keeping that label alive. 
Well, we are proud to kind of be the stewards of it now. It, it's been a lifelong labor of love for Hank O'Neill and Andy Sordoni, and we are honored to be able to try to maintain that tradition as best we can. And thank you very much, Chris, for being our opening announcer. Uh, we're about to close the program now with the closing announcer, who is a different guy. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Spirit of Jazz podcast. This is a production of Presby Bop Music. To find out more about Presby Bop, our music, concerts, and recordings, please explore our website at www.presbybop.com. And send us a note telling us what you think about the Spirit of Jazz. We'd love to hear from you. Check in with us again next time. I'm Jeff Kellum. And I'm Bill Carter. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Christmas Music to Jazz Feeling. I'm Hank O'Neill, and with thanks and best Christmas wishes to my very special guests, Dave and Iola Brubeck. Thank you, Hank. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to everyone out there. And let's pray for peace in the new year. Amen. Amen.